Greetings. I often say at the end of my videos that I look forward to the comments of others. And, you know, if you watch a bunch of my videos, you're likely to hear that said at the end of most of them. And, and I really do mean it when I say it. I really do look forward to the comments of others because the comments section becomes an opportunity to trade notes and collectively improve our understanding of the subject that's under discussion. You know, there are times when I'm gaining new insights from the comments on my videos, and I really do appreciate that. So in this video, I'd like to share a recent example of that. A little over a week ago, I received a comment on a video I made nearly two years ago titled Abba Bivens Identity, in which I put forth a case that the man known as Abba Bivens was Edward Meredith Bivens. Now, the relevant comment shared the uh, author's understanding that, and the author of the comment, that shared his understanding that Bivens' name may have been W. Henry E. Bivens, and that he had written a book titled Marks of a Lost Race. Now, when I saw the title of the book in the comment, I had to do a double take, as I've actually come across that title before, but I never associated it with Bibbins. You see, back in 1952, there was an article which appeared in the journal Phylon, which was authored by uh, Howard Bratz. And on page 327 of that issue, the article shares a long excerpt from an interview with a member of the Commandment Keepers. And that person claimed to have written a book titled Marks of a Lost Race. Unfortunately, I never thought to associate that with Bibbins because if you follow the quote's reference to the sixth footnote at the bottom of the page, one finds that that statement is attributed to a man named Robert Smith. You know, so it, it never stood out that this person being called Robert Smith was actually Abba Bibbins. However, after receiving that aforementioned comment on my video, I went ahead and looked the book up on WorldCat, you know, on the, the World Catalog, worldcat.org, and sure enough, the author is listed as W. Henry E. Bibbins. Now, regarding that name, permit me to refer back to the Commandment Keeper's attendance log from the 1940s, which is available at the Schomburg Center, and uh, it also came up in my video on the identity of Abba Bibbins from nearly two years ago. Uh, now, in that uh, attendance log of the Commandment Keepers, not only was Edward Meredith Bibbins recorded as attending, but so too was one of his sons, William H. Bibbins, or W.H. Bibbins, if you, you know, reduce the first and middle name to their initials. You know, I, I, seeing that, I have to wonder if perhaps his son played a role in the writing or editing of that book. Uh, whatever the case, Seeing the book on WorldCat, I wanted to take a look at it. I wanted to see if I could, you know, get my hands on a copy. And I saw that one copy is at the Library of Northwestern University in Illinois. And I'm happy to report that I was able to browse the book. So in this video, I'd like to offer some preliminary comments on some of the content as, you know, it, it really does have re relevance to One West history. Uh, now, both myself uh, and or Vocab Malone may have more to say on this subject in the near future. But for now, I'd just like to quickly run through some of the points which stood out for me. Right Now, first, regarding the author, W. Henry E. Bibbins, as I just alluded to, I wonder if that might have been intended as a reference to both Bibbins and his son, William, William H. The book does often use the first person plural self-referentially. Now, as a disclaimer, that could just be a writing convention as, you know, there's lots of authors who, you know, they write by themselves. You know, it's just one author, yet he'll refer to himself in the first person plural, right? Some, you know, and sometimes this is called the royal plural. But it is nonetheless possible that W. Henry refers to the son, William H. Bibbins, while that E refers to the father, Edward Meredith Bibbins, the latter being, you know, Abba Bibbins. But of course, you know, there are other possibilities, such as maybe the son William writing the book by himself, or the senior Bibbins wrote it by himself but employed a pen name or an alias of sorts, right? And, but of course, these are all speculative. Nonetheless, it is interesting that Bratz attributed this to a person named Robert Smith. I have to wonder if... Perhaps the names got mixed up in his notes, or I would think more likely, maybe he, he did interview Bibbins, but Bibbins himself may have given uh, a pseudonym, you know, perhaps because he was wary or, you know, somewhat uh, skeptical about this person who was interviewing members of the commandment keepers, you know? And uh, if that's the case, then perhaps it could be said that he used an alias on two different occasions, right? But whatever case, getting to the book itself, 
uh, just want to run through some interesting points that I saw. And I don't intend any of this polemically. I'm just sharing stuff that I think is, is interesting and or relevant to One West history. And so to begin, on page 7, there's an interesting statement that the truth was never taught between the year 70 AD and the year 1914, with that latter year marking the beginning of the end of the Gentiles' age or the Gentiles' dispensation. That aside, another thing I want to note is that the New Testament is referenced throughout this book. Now, this is a point of interest because, you know, there are some people who dispute whether Bibbins taught from the New Testament. Now, we know that Bibbins referenced the New Testament in the one audio recording of his voice that, that's available online. And he also alluded to it in the letter he sent to Hatsad Harishon, which I showed in my video from nearly two years ago on, on Abba Bibbins' identity. In this book, the New Testament is referenced on almost every other page. So I think it's fair to conclude that, uh, that Bibbins definitely taught from the New Testament. However, to be fair, it's also worth noting that this book was written while he was at the Commandment Keepers, so there may remain an open question as to how he perceived the New Testament, you know? Whatever the case, uh, moving on from that, on page 10, the book introduces the idea that some New Testament references to Gentiles may actually be referring to Israelites who profess to be Gentiles. So this concept, which is, you know, found amongst many one Westers, apparently goes back to Bibbins himself, perhaps as far back as the early 1950s. However, interestingly, shortly thereafter, the book states that Romans 10.9 is addressed to actual natural Gentiles. I wonder, you know, what that might mean about Gentile salvation. The impression I got is that Bibbins may have been open to that, to natural Gentile salvation. But uh, I do understand that maybe other One Westers would take a different view. So, you know, uh, consider there's, treat my uh, impression as having a margin of error. Uh, by the way, also notice the reference to the Lord Joshua. It's worth noting that the book often refers to Jesus as Joshua, no doubt capturing an effort to put forth a more Hebrew name. And, you know, therefore, this is a sort of precursor to the later One West practice of referring to Jesus as Yahweh Shai, which is, you know, Joshua in the Lashawan Kodash pronunciation. Now, those who are interested in the topic of Deuteronomy 28 may find particular interest in pages 14 to 21 which offer a seven-page-long verse-by-verse breakdown of that chapter, and, of course, the discussion culminates with verse 68. On page 23, it is stated that none of the immediate descendants of Noah's three sons were quote-unquote white, but they nonetheless ran across a spectrum of skin tones. On page 25, the belief that quote-unquote white people are Edomites is put forth, and their skin tones are also attributed to leprosy. Uh, on an interesting side note relevant to the date of this book, Bibbins appeals to the book of Obadiah, but shows no awareness of the moon landing. You know, the, the book doesn't have a year listed in any of its pages, you know, not in the front of the book or anything like that. But I would assume that this is indeed the same book, which was mentioned in that 1952 interview with Howard Bratz. And, you know, rather than being a later revision or something like that. And uh, Bibbins likewise calls European Jews Edomites and even makes a passing reference to them speaking Yiddish rather than Hebrew. Uh, however, uh, let me point out that there are no clear indications of Lashwan Kodash in the book. Uh, while I did not see any attempt to break down the tribes, Bibbins does describe Judah as, quote, the blackest of all his brothers, end quote. And he references Jeremiah 14, too, amongst various other verses to, in support of that position. Uh, interestingly, Bibbins invokes the speckled bird in Jeremiah to argue that the Israelites run across a spectrum of skin tones, black, brown, yellow, etc. And uh, those who are familiar with uh, uh, One Westers may know that the, this uh, interpretation is put forth to this day. Uh, towards the end of the book, there's a discussion on the feast days, which I personally found particularly interesting. Uh, Bibbins recognizes Rosh Hashanah as, you know, which in the fall as the new year, which uh, differs from, you know, the approach which one Westers currently take. Beyond that, he also recognizes the rabbinic festival of Shemini Atzeret, uh, he alludes to it end as, you know, ending the yearly cycle of Torah readings, which seems to show that, you know, he recognized the, the, the parashot, the, um, the rabbinic division of weekly Torah portions or weekly Torah readings. I, I thought that was interesting. Now, when discussing uh, Purim and Passover, one gets the impression that Bibbins might have 
taken the position that they fell on fixed dates on the solar calendar. Uh, now, I know some people might be quick to attribute that to him being in a uh, an early stage of familiarity with the subject, but I am. It's uh, I could be wrong about this, but I've heard that uh, GOCC might be holding to a solar calendar. Calendar, so you know, mem if that's true, maybe uh, members of GOCC might find that interesting. If if that statement about GOCC holding to a solar calendar calendar is mistaken, I apologize, but. Whatever the case. and But getting back to Bibbins, uh, so too when he discusses the first month and the seventh month, uh, you know, one again gets the impression that he had them aligning with months on the solar calendar, on the Gregorian calendar, you know, rather than just sort of uh, partially overlapping with such months. I, I thought that was interesting as well. But that aside, perhaps the most interesting detail comes on the back cover of the book, where there's an ink stamp which reads Property of the Israel Tanakh School at 1 West 125th Street in New York City. I would be reluctant to say that that means that 1 West existed when the book was written. Rather, I would propose that the book stayed amongst Bibbins and his, his students on into the late 60s and early 70s. Now, how this particular book wound up at Northwestern University's library is an interesting question, which I do not know the answer to at this time, but I hope to look into it because I think that might have an, there might be an interesting story there as well. We'll see. I'll certainly share it if I find out anything. On that note, I'll close here, and you know, uh, but I want to close with a couple of acknowledgments. First, I want to thank the gentleman who left that comment on my video a little over a week ago, as it honestly provided a valuable piece uh, to add to our evolving understanding of this puzzle, of, of, which is, you know, One West history, or the early history of One West and Abba Bibbins, etc. Uh, I also must confess that my attempts to research One West history in general, and Abba Bibbins in particular, has benefited tremendously from the work and research of Sam Kestenbaum. I definitely recommend his piece titled, I'm an Israelite, Kendrick Lamar's Spiritual Search, Hebrew Israelite Religion, and the Politics of a Celebrity Encounter, which is uh, the 16th chapter in the Routledge uh, compilation titled, Kendrick Lamar and the Making of Black Meaning. Uh, for anyone who's interested in researching some of these topics, I think you'd find particularly interesting the plethora of endnotes in, uh, you know, appended to uh, Mr. Kestenbaum's uh, article. Uh, with that, I hope others who are interested in piecing together One West History found this interesting. As always, I look forward to the comments of others. And again, I really do mean that this video is an example of how the conversation can benefit from the comments of others. On that note, God bless.